This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, The Education of a Personage. Chapter Three, Young Irony. Part Two. The End of Summer. No wind is stirring in the grass. Not one wind stirs. The water in the hidden pools as glass fronts the full moon and so inters the golden token in its icy mass. Chanted Eleanor to the trees that skeletoned the body of the night. Isn't it ghostly here? If you can hold your horse's feet up, let's cut through the woods and find the hidden pools. It's after one, and you'll get the devil, he objected. I don't know enough about horses to put one away in the pitch dark. Shut up, you old fool, she whispered irreverently, and leaning over, she patted him lazily with her riding crop. You can leave your old plug in our stable, and I'll send him over tomorrow. But my uncle has got to drive me to the station with this old plug at seven o'clock. Don't be a spoil sport, remember? You have a tendency toward wavering that prevents you from being the entire light of my life. Amory drew up his horse close beside, and leaning toward her, grasped her hand. Say I am quick, or I'll pull you over and make you ride behind me. She looked up and smiled and shook her head excitedly. Oh, do! Or rather don't. Why are all the exciting things so uncomfortable? Like fighting and exploring and skiing in Canada. By the way, we're going to ride up Harper's Hill. I think that comes in our program about five o'clock. You little devil, Amory growled. You're going to make me stay up all night and sleep in the train like an immigrant all day tomorrow going back to New York. Hush, someone's coming along the road. Let's go. woo And with a shout that probably gave the belated traveller a series of shivers, she turned her horse into the woods and Amory followed slowly, as he had followed her all day for three weeks. The summer was over, but he had spent the days in watching Eleanor a graceful, facile Manfred, build herself intellectual and imaginative pyramids while she reveled in the artificialities of the temperamental teens, and they wrote poetry at the dinner-table. When vanity kissed vanity a hundred happy Junes ago, he pondered o'er her breathlessly, and that all men might ever know, he rhymed her eyes with life and death. Through time I'll save my love, he said, yet beauty vanished with his breath, and with her lovers she was dead. Ever his wit and not her eyes, ever his art and not her hair, who'd learned a trick in rhyme, be wise, and pause before his sonnet there. So all my words, however true, might sing you to a thousandth June, and no one ever know that you were beauty for an afternoon. So he wrote one day, and he pondered how coldly we thought of the dark lady of the sonnets, and how little we remembered her as the great man wanted her remembered. For what Shakespeare must have desired to have been able to write with such divine despair was that the lady should live, and now we have no real interest in her. The irony of it is that if he had cared more for the poem than for the lady, the sonnet would be only obvious, imitative rhetoric, and no one would ever have read it after twenty years. This was the last night Amory ever saw Eleanor. He was leaving in the morning, and they had agreed to take a long farewell trot by the cold moonlight. She wanted to talk, she said, perhaps the last time in her life that she could be rational. She meant pose with comfort. So they had turned into the woods and rode for half an hour with scarcely a word, except when she whispered damn at a bothersome branch, whispered it as no other girl was ever able to whisper it. Then they started up Harper's Hill, walking their tired horses. "'Good Lord, it's quiet here,' whispered Eleanor. "'Much more lonesome than the woods.' 
I hate woods," Amory said, shuddering. "Any kind of foliage or underbrush at night. Out here it's so broad and easy on the spirit." The long slope of a long hill, and the cold moon rolling moonlight down it, and thee and me last and most important. It was quiet that night. The straight road they followed up to the edge of the cliff knew few footsteps at any time. Only an occasional negro cabin, silver gray in the rock-ribbed moonlight, broke the long line of bare ground. Behind lay the black edge of the woods, like a dark frosting on a white cake, and ahead, the sharp, high horizon. It was much colder, so cold that it settled on them. And drove all the warm nights from their minds. The end of summer," said Eleanor softly. "Listen to the beat of our horses' hoofs, tump tump, tump a tump. Have you ever been feverish and had all noises divide into tump tump tump, until you could swear eternity was divisible into so many tumps? That's the way I feel. Old horses go tump tump." I guess that's the only thing that separates horses and clocks from us. Human beings can't go tump 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 without going crazy. The breeze freshened, and Eleanor pulled her cape around her and shivered. "Are you very cold?" asked Amory. "No, I'm thinking about myself, my black old inside self, the real one, with the fundamental honesty that keeps me from being absolutely wicked." By making me realize my own sins. They were riding up close by the cliff, and Amory gazed over, where the fall met the ground a hundred feet below. A black stream made a sharp line, broken by tiny glints in the swift water. Rotten, rotten old world," broke out Eleanor suddenly. "And the wretchedest thing of all is me. Oh, why am I a girl?" Why am I not a stupid? Look at you! You're stupider than I am, not much, but some. And you can lope about and get bored, and then lope somewhere else. And you can play around with girls without being involved in meshes of sentiment. And you can do anything and be justified. And here am I, with the brains to do everything, yet tied to the sinking ship of future matrimony. If I were born a hundred years from now, well and good. But now, what's in store for me? I have to marry. That goes without saying. Who? I'm too bright for most men, and yet I have to descend to their level and let them patronize my intellect in order to get their attention. Every year that I don't marry, I've got less chance for a first-class man. At the best, I can have my choice from one or two cities, and of course, I have to marry into a dinner coat. Listen. She leaned close again. I like clever men and good-looking men, and of course, no one cares more for personality than I do. Oh, just one person in fifty has any glimmer of what sex is. I'm hipped on Freud and all that, but it's rotten that every bit of real love in the world is ninety-nine percent passion and one little soupçon of jealousy. She finished as suddenly as she began. Of course, you're right. Amory agreed, "It's a rather unpleasant, overpowering force that's part of the machinery under everything. It's like an actor that lets you see his mechanics. Wait a minute till I think this out." He paused and tried to get a metaphor. They had turned the cliff and were riding along the road about fifty feet to the left. You see, everyone's got to have some cloak to throw around it. The mediocre intellects, Plato's second class. Use the remnants of romantic chivalry, diluted with Victorian sentiment, and we who consider ourselves the intellectuals cover it up by pretending that it's another side of us and has nothing to do with our shining brains. We pretend that the fact that we realize it is really absolving us from being a prey to it, but the truth is that sex is right in the middle of our purest abstractions, so close that it obscures vision. I can kiss you now and will. He leaned toward her in his saddle, but she drew away. I can't, I can't kiss you now. I'm more sensitive. 
"'You're more stupid, then,' he declared rather impatiently. "'Intellect is no protection from sex any more than convention is—' "'What is?' she fired up. "'The Catholic Church or the Maxims of Confucius?' Amory looked up, rather taken aback. "'That's your panacea, isn't it?' she cried. "'Oh, you're just an old hypocrite, too. Thousands of scowling priests keep the degenerate Italians and illiterate Irish repentant with the gabble-gabble about the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. It's just all cloaks, sentiment, and spiritual rouge and panaceas. I'll tell you, there is no God, not even a definite abstract goodness.' So it's all got to be worked out for the individual by the individual here in high white foreheads like mine. And you're too much the prig to admit it. She let go her reins and shook her little fists at the stars. If there is a God, let him strike me! Strike me! Talking about God again after the manner of atheists, Amory said sharply. His materialism, always a thin cloak, was torn to shreds by Eleanor's blasphemy. She knew it, and it angered him that she knew it. "'And like most intellectuals who don't find faith convenient,' he continued coldly, "'like Napoleon and Oscar Wilde and the rest of your type, "'you'll yell loudly for a priest on your deathbed.' Eleanor drew her horse up sharply, and he reined in beside her. "'Will I?' she said in a queer voice that scared him. "'Will I? Watch! I'm going over the cliff!' and before he could interfere she had turned and was riding breakneck for the end of the plateau. He wheeled and started after her, his body like ice, his nerves in a vast clangor. There was no chance of stopping her. The moon was under a cloud, and her horse would step blindly over. Then, some ten feet from the edge of the cliff, she gave a sudden shriek and flung herself sideways, plunged from her horse, and rolling over twice, "'landed in a pile of brush five feet from the edge. "'The horse went over with a frantic whinny. "'In a minute he was by Eleanor's side "'and saw that her eyes were open. "'Eleanor!' he cried. "'She did not answer, "'but her lips moved and her eyes filled with sudden tears. "'Eleanor, are you hurt?' "'No, I don't think so,' she said faintly, "'and then began weeping.' My horse dead? Good God, yes. Oh, she wailed. I thought I was going over. I, I didn't know. He helped her gently to her feet and boosted her on to his saddle. So they started homeward, Amory walking, and she bent forward on the pommel, sobbing bitterly. I've got a crazy streak, she faltered. Twice before I've done things like that. When I was eleven, Mother went—went went mad, stock-raving crazy. We were in Vienna. All the way back she talked haltingly about herself, and Amory's love waned slowly with the moon. At the door they started from habit to kiss good-night, but she could not run into his arms, nor were they stretched to meet her as in the week before. For a minute they stood there, hating each other with a bitter sadness— but as Amory had loved himself in Eleanor, so now what he hated was only a mirror. Their poses were strewn about the pale lawn like broken glass. The stars were long gone, and there were left only the little sighing gusts of wind and the silences between. But naked souls are poor things ever, and soon he turned homeward and let new lights come in with the sun. A poem that Eleanor sent Amory several years later. Here, earthborn, over the lilt of the water, lisping its music and bearing a burden of light, bosoming day as a laughing and radiant daughter, here we may whisper unheard, unafraid of the night. Walking alone, was it splendor or what we were bound with? Deep in the time when summer lets down her hair, Shadows we loved, and the patterns they covered the ground with, Tapestries, mystical, faint in the breathless air. That was the day, and the night for another story, Pale as a dream and shadowed with penciled trees. Ghosts of the stars came by, who had sought for glory, 
whispered to us of peace in the plaintive breeze, whispered of old dead faiths that the day had shattered, youth the penny that brought delight of the moon. That was the urge that we knew, and the language that mattered. That was the debt that we paid to the usurer June. Here deepest of dreams by the waters that bring not anything back of the past that we need not know. What if the light is but sun, and the little streams sing not? We are together. It seems I have loved you so. What did the last night hold, with the summer over? Drawing us back to the home in the changing glade. What leered out of the darkness in the ghostly clover? God, till you stirred in your sleep and were wild afraid. Well, we have passed. We are chronicle now to the eerie. Curious metal from meteors that failed in the sky. Earthborn the tireless is stretched by the water, quite weary. Close to this ununderstandable changeling that's I. Fear is an echo we trace to security's daughter. Now we are faces and voices, and less too soon, whispering half love over the lilt of the water, youth, the penny that brought the light of the moon. A poem Amory sent to Eleanor which he called Summer Storm. Faint winds, and a song fading, and leaves falling. Faint winds, and far away a fading laughter. And the rain, and over the fields a voice calling. Our grey-blown cloud scurries and lifts above, slides on the sun and flutters there to waft her sisters on. The shadow of a dove falls on the coat. The trees are filled with wings. And down the valley through the crying trees the body of the darker storm flies, brings with its new air the breath of sunken seas and slender, tenuous thunder. But I wait. Wait for the mists and for the blacker rain, heavier winds that stir the veil of fate, happier winds that pile her hair again. They tear me, teach me, strew the heavy air upon me, Winds that I know, and storm. There was a summer every rain was rare. There was a season every wind was warm. And now you pass me in the mist. Your hair rain-blown about you. Damp lips curved once more in that wild irony. That gay despair that made you old when we have met before. Wraith-like you drift on out before the rain. Across the fields, blown with the stemless flowers, with your old hopes, dead leaves and loves again, dim as a dream and wan with all old hours. Whispers will creep into the growing dark, tumult will die over the trees. Now night. Tears from her wetted breast, the splattered blouse of day, glides down the dreaming hills, tear bright to cover with her hair the eerie green. Love for the dusk, love for the glistening after. Quiet, the trees, to their last tops, serene. Faint winds, and far away a fading laughter. End of Book Two, Chapter Three, Part Two